Okay, thank you very much for joining everyone to this um, webinar brought to you by the Municipal Climate Services Collaborative. Um, my name is Dustin Carey. I'm a capacity building officer with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And we're here to, today to discuss um, the MCSC's new uh, guide, talking it through how to start your climate adaptation conversations for members um, of the audience which uh, are, who are francophone. We do have simultaneous interpretation available um, for this webinar. Down on the bottom row, you'll find a uh, button note uh, interpretation and you can select French if that is your preferred language. Um, today, we'll, uh, I'll be, um, I and a colleague with the Canadian Center for uh, Climate Services will be providing a brief introduction to the Municipal Climate Services Collaborative. Um, we will then hear from Eva Jackson uh, from ICLE Canada, who is the primary author behind this guide, and she'll walk you through um, the content of it and some of the uh, accompanying resources. We will then hear from um, Dwayne Nickel from the City of Selkirk and Karina Richters from the City of Windsor, two of the communities which are featured within this guide. So um, one of the really primary, uh, primary drivers behind the formation of the uh, Municipal Climate Services Collaborative was that across Canada, um, municipal administration and decision makers are increasingly recognizing the um, impacts associated with climate change, that it is a problem, and that communities have a role in um, addressing it, both on the climate mitigation and on the adaptation side. Um, we see year over year um, uh, really severe impacts um, associated with climate change and severe weather and those have been resonating quite strongly with um, asset managers, um, senior administration, sustainability practices, engineers and the like. So more and more uh, there have been calls for solutions being enacted at the local scale. Um, after all, local governments, uh, their infrastructure and services are to a very high degree the first line of defense of residents um, against these severe weather and climate impacts. However, we um, have noticed that the um, scale of response to these impacts have not kept pace with the awareness. There has been an implementation deficit associated with this. So um, conversations were began a few years ago between the municipal, Municipalities for Climate Innovation Program through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Canadian Center for Climate Services um, on ways to address this. Um, one, of the, uh, one of those Two, the Municipalities for Climate Innovation Program is a five-year uh, program financed by Infrastructure Canada and delivered by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Um, it has the three primary objectives of um, enabling communities to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, um, adapt to local um, climate change impacts, as well as bring in climate change considerations, primarily on that resilient side, but also on the mitigation component into um, asset management practices. And I will turn it over to my colleague Zenab to explain the Canadian Center for Climate Services. Hello everyone, my name is Zena Bogle and I'm a policy advisor with the Outreach and Engagement team of CCS. So thanks Dustin for those introductory slides. So I'll just give a little bit of an overview of the Canadian Center for Climate Services. Many of you uh, might already be familiar with the center. It was launched by Environment and Climate Change Canada in 2018 and provides Canadians with information and support to consider climate change and their decisions. It provides several pieces of, of ways that uh, users can engage with the center. Uh, one of them is a support desk to help answer questions of diverse users of climate information. It also has a website which provides access to climate data sets and a suite of climate data portals um, and links to several resources and introductory concepts of climate change that, that folks might useful. There's also training that's provided on the use of climate information to various users, um, initiatives to support user, user engagement on of current users and future potential users of climate information, and also new products and information uh, data products continue to be developed. The center also collaborates with uh, regional climate consortia to deliver services 
with locally relevant information uh, to users. And the three consortia that we currently work with are the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium in British Columbia, Uranus in Quebec, and the recently lost, launched Climate West hub that will be operating out of the prairies. We are looking to develop a northern Atlantic hub um, soon also. Uh, next slide, uh, Dustin, please. So as we realize, um, Canadian municipalities are very diverse in terms of their geography, their size, the environments within that which they uh, operate, their capacity. So that suggests that we really need to have a diversity of approaches to considering climate change in uh, municipal decision making. And, and local context is really important. There's just some facts noted on the side, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, of, of the, the, number, the great number of municipalities within Canada. And, and two in five Canadians live within the largest 15 of those municipalities. And 90% um, of Canada's municipalities are located outside census metropolitan area. So you do have a, quite a variety there. Uh, next slide, please. So the Municipal Climate Services Collaborative was really um, uh, built or um, created by the Municipal Climate Information Program and the Canadian Centre of Climate Services and it provides insight in the use of climate information and guides the development of adapt adaptation knowledge project, uh, products because we realize the use of climate information within municipal planning and decision processes is a key component of efficient and effective climate adaptation. The next slide please. This uh, figure here just uh, demonstrates the, uh, the members of the MCSC. There's currently 24 members and then representatives of the FCM and Environment and Climate Change Canada. As you can see, their membership from across the country. And next slide, please. So this leads me to the next piece, which uh, Eva Jackson will explain and provide some insight on is the development of a guide this past August which is titled Talking It Through, a discussion guide for local government staff on climate adaptation. It was supported by the MCSC and uh, helps municipalities to start that conversation. So I'll turn it over to you, Eva. Thank you, Zeneb. I will try to take control here without losing everybody. Um, here we go, desktop one. Bear with me for one moment. And I'll ask you, uh, Dustin or Zeneb, for a thumbs up if it's the full screen and not presenter view. Great, a true summer's day in November miracle. Um, thanks everybody. I will uh, try to keep my overview uh, <clears throat> fairly brief, though it is quite a um, substantive kind of piece of work to get through quickly, but I know uh, everybody's really interested to hear from the two case studies from Karina and Duane, so I wanna give them adequate time and hopefully some time for questions at the end. <clears throat> but as both Dustin and Zineb have said, I'm Eva Jackson, I'm Managing Director with ICLE Canada. I have the pleasure of sitting on the MCSC uh, as well as having been, um, ICLE having been selected to author the discussion guide. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is two main things. One, do an overview of the main elements of the discussion guide uh, to help you navigate using it. Uh, and then as well do not quite a deep dive, but a bit of a nutshell into some of the accompanying products that we made to support the use of the discussion guide and the discussions that we hope it spurs on in communities across the country. Um, as uh, both Zeneb and Dustin said, the discussion guide came out of uh, work planning of the MCSC um, and was really meant to help start and facilitate conversations in communities across the country where uh, perhaps they hadn't started around advancing climate change adaptation. Now we wanted to be um, what I call entry point neutral, whether a municipality wanted to embark on the route of risk assessment and adaptation planning or directly into service delivery and integration into operational decisions. So we tried to use that as a frame in writing the guide. Um, but really it was meant to serve as uh, a way to broker conversations between decision makers and elected officials uh, around the impacts of climate change, current levels of preparedness and what could be done, uh, what measures and solutions could be taken to advance adaptation. Uh, so the guide starts with a very loose overview of climate change impacts in the Canadian context. 
We've kept it quite uh, loose because there's many resources supported um, by uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada specifically and Natural Resources Canada that uh, go into great deal, go into great detail as to uh, how the climate is changing in Canada. So the point of these, this section of the guide is really to get users to those more fulsome resources while at the same time providing a bit of an overview. Uh, it then really drills down to what are some of those impacts facing local governments in particular. And I wanted to pick up on Zeneb's point that um, there really is a diversity of local governments in Canada. You know, we go from small rural hamlets of a couple dozen people all the way to major urban and metrop metropolitan centers like Metro Vancouver, Toronto, the Montreal area. Um, so we wanted to capture the diversity um, of impacts through you know, charts and infographics like these. And then spend a little bit of time um, to try and explain the different geographic contexts that influence climate change impacts. And we felt it was important to make the guide usable by local government staff anywhere in Canada. So we tried to include sections that spell out some of the unique challenges, um, but really some of the opportunities for three contexts. So we have a little section on urban communities um, that touch on some of the challenges in urban communities as well as opportunities. These are, you know, frequently centers of commerce, um, centers of innovation, etc. We have a section on rural and remote communities. <clears throat> And, you know, we talk about the strong connection in these types of communities between um, decision makers and residents and businesses, but as well some of the challenges of aging populations, um, it, uh, costly and aging infrastructure, etc. And then a section on northern communities, focusing in on some of the biophysical uh, impacts happening there, but as well as um, uh, what some of the opportunities are in the North for addressing climate change. Uh, we then wanted to um, give a bit of a 101, I guess, so that when we use certain terms that they're interpreted by the reader in the same way. So go over some of those basics, and this is exactly what you would expect would be here, the difference between adaptation and mitigation, why adaptation is important within local governments. Uh, and then I'm particularly happy that we've included this section on Indigenous perspectives of climate adaptation and <clears throat> how these may differ from uh, Western perspectives, but how both together uh, can really form a fulsome perspective and understanding of adaptation and um, how traditional local governments can benefit from integrating Indigenous perspectives of adaptation into their work as it advances. Uh, <clears throat> We then really start to get into what adaptation looks like, um, just to paint a picture that this isn't always, um, you know, shoveling ground actions uh, that cost millions or billions of dollars, but really range the gamut from education and information provision, uh, policy and program development. Um, there's a great deal of work happening in the advocacy, outreach and engagement um, space with local governments acting as conveners in that work. But then as well, the uh, ones we traditionally think of, those capital investments <clears throat> towards adapted and resilient infrastructure. Uh, we hear a lot about nature-based solutions. So we'll try to present the, a holistic perspective of what adaptation might look like at the local level. There's a sampling of examples. Um, I know there are efforts being made to um, create these types of catalogs now of more adaptation actions. So we really just have a rudimentary piece here. Um, the case studies certainly go into more detail, but we have a small map with some of the some examples of those different types of adaptation actions. And then <clears throat> the guide really uh, sort of goes two routes to present uh, the two main approaches to climate change adaptation. So what we call a service delivery based approach, um, where adaptation is not integrated into formal planning documents necessarily, like an official community plan or an official plan or a regional growth strategy, mm -hmm. but rather is integrated into service delivery plans or operational decisions that are made on a day-to-day -day basis, where those daily decisions serve as an opportunity to integrate adaptation considerations into local government action. 
Oh, and conversely, planning-based approaches, where climate information and other data uh, is integrated into those types of foundational plans. So I mentioned official plans or official community plans. And those plans, once they're implemented and approved through council, facilitate multiple decision points. Um, and because of that, climate will have been at least preliminarily included into decision making. So I hope you can see how those two are different. They're certainly not mutually exclusive and often happen hand in hand, but we saw these as different entry points or levers into um, adaptation work by local governments. Um, we, the guide goes into some detail on both types of approaches and gets into some of the questions that need uh, to, some of the conversations that need to be had uh, if one entry point is chosen over another. Um, so some of these are presented on the slide, but again, um, it goes into some detail in the discussion guide there. Um, and then again, <clears throat> for planning based approaches. So that some of the pros and cons of each approach are presented uh, as well as examples of how uh, these have been used. We then sort of get back to our mandate of being a discussion guide to categorize the types of conversations that are had and as well with whom one might have these conversations. Um, so we, you know, we've, this section of the discussion guide, as I said, to kind of transitions from a lot of that contextual information in the preceding questions to the details of having specific climate conversations. And um, this graphic really was meant to help orient the user where they are already. Um, on this continuum from not having undertaken any uh, formal effort uh, on the left to in the center having perhaps done some climate risk assessment or having integrated adaptation into day-to-day -day decisions whether that's through asset management or emergency response um, through to you know monitoring and eval evaluation where one is measuring the impact of specific adaptation interventions um, and ultimately, the guide is trying to depict that irrespective of where on that continuum one sees themselves, there are additional climate conversations that should be occurring. Because you've finished an adaptation plan, um, probably your most important conversations are ahead of you in that you now have to start implementing against that plan. Um, <clears throat> we then, <clears throat> excuse me, too much talking. <clears throat> we, um, we then wanted to try and develop a matrix to help identify with whom a user could have that discussion. You know, if you're really starting at this beginning early days, you know, you want to focus on people that have high interest in this topic, but also high influence. So the sweet spot um, in this matrix ideally would be who one can find. And we try to kind of discuss who might within the discussion guide, discuss who might fall within these different buckets, so to speak. Um, and then we, um, I suppose we close out that, close out that section of the guide by focusing on some of these guiding principles for effective adaptation. And these again are uh, elements that we want users to keep top of mind as they're advancing conversations. So, you know, for example, I'll just do a couple of these balance, you know, considering both immediate and long-term needs, um, while climate projections look out 20, 50, 100 years into the future, many weather related impacts are being felt today. So we, we suggest that one of the principles is taking a balanced approach to affect both current effects as well as long term uh, changes into future climate. Um, and one that I think is important for anybody looking to have conversations with senior decision makers or elected officials is recognizing existing work so that your colleagues don't see this as an additional burden or an additional task, but rather something that in many ways is already being done and has been part of the, the community for a long time, but perhaps just hasn't been labeled <laughs> as adaptation. You know, stormwater management comes to mind. Um, so you just have been working on this for decades, um, but now there's, you know, this future proofing that needs to be layered into that. 
Um, the transition between the case studies and the main guide is this self-assessment to establish your own adaptation context. So there's a series of questions that a user would go through to help them navigate the case studies and determine which of the case studies included uh, is the most uh, appropriate for their community to um, consider. And so there's these six questions um, that are located in that section of the guide that then take you to the five case studies included within take it, talking it through. So we've got case studies that try to span different types of communities, uh, coastal, inland, small, large, uh, northern, southern communities. Uh, and we have the five case studies are Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, Prince George, British Columbia, Windsor, Ontario, Selkirk, Manitoba, and Dawson City, Yukon. Um, so I'm really happy that we have uh, Karina here from Windsor and Dwayne from Selkirk to talk about their stories. Um, in going in having undergone this process in different ways, but still advancing at quite a pace on the adaptation file. Uh, I won't get into the details of the case studies, but just to note that they've we've tried to write them in a consistent way. So you want, a reader can really compare the different approaches, um, focusing in not only on what was done, but the next steps and some of the lessons learned and things that should be replicated uh, if another community wanted to take this approach. Um, so again, We've got cases on the five communities. My favorite photo in the guide, Mr. PG here. Um, uh, I, I certainly won't focus on Windsor and Selkirk because I won't do them as much justice as my friends. Uh, and then the guide ends with two accompanying products. And these ones um, were developed as we were writing the guide. Naturally, you can imagine there is so much content on adaptation. Uh, if we tried to put it into one tome, we'd be looking at hundreds and hundreds of pages that no one would ever read. So we wanted to try and figure out a useful way um, to provide access to additional resources or next steps or uh, different products that an end user could use. And so we came up with this idea of two accompanying products. Um, the first is a list of additional resources, um, which is just an Excel table of approximately 30-ish resources that we hope will help local governments either begin or continue their desired adaptation process or approach. So we've broken this table into identifying the categories as a guidebook, <clears throat> a tool, a program, um, a link to it so you could just click the hyperlink and get there, who the author is, when it was published, and the types of decisions that resource could help support. So whether those are planning decisions, assessment, service delivery, et cetera. Um, and then a little bit on the use parameters. Some of these are national in scale, others are regional or provincial in scale. So we tried to include that. The link there, I don't believe this is a hyperlink on my slide deck, but it's pretty easy to remember is fcm.ca slash climate convos. And you can download obviously the discussion guide, but as well, just these individual resources. And the second one, and I'm going to attempt some pretty bold PowerPointing here to try and switch to my to show you the PowerPoint template. And I think I'll just try to fill some airtime as I'm doing that. Um, jumping from one deck to another, you can all look at my calendar in the meantime. Um, this slide, so this PowerPoint, what we wanted to do, and I don't think I'm sharing yet, so now I've uh, it's coming can you all through. see? Oh, great. So a bit of panic, but it's working there. So what we wanted to do in this accompanying resource, and this was an idea of, <clears throat> I believe, my colleagues at FCM and the Canadian Center for Climate Services, was to say that sometimes one needs an aid in having these climate conversations. That, you know, someone like me is just quite happy to talk at everybody, but others might want a you know, something to stand behind. So we thought we'd create a template PowerPoint uh, deck that could be used to help start a conversation if it's less formal, or perhaps give a presentation to council or to a standing environment committee on advancing this. So the purpose of this template you'll see is not to be used exactly as it is, but to be customized based on what it is that um, a user wants to talk about. So, you know, we have some instructional text for a community. So let's pretend Dustin works for the city of Moosonee and he's gonna have this conversation. 
um, you know, he'd take a look at this, read through the instructions that are given in the text, and then customize it for himself. Um, so, uh, you know, we say place your logo in this area, put the name of your local government. We're trying to make it so you can just take it and run with it as a user. I won't go through the entire slide deck because it's actually quite lengthy. It's 34 slides, but just to show you a couple of features, um, trying to see. Uh, here we go. Um, this next one says, you know, please populate the slide with a vision statement for a resilient community. Um, it gives some examples there. <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to show you in presenter view. However, um, if you were looking at it in standard view, there'd be comment comment boxes that you could click on that would say, you know, go to climatedata.ca and get the climate projections for your community and insert them here um, to really walk through what you would include in such a presentation. And so uh, we've tried to uh, include the directions on what to do and where to go to complete those directions. And I guess one thing I'd want to add is we don't anticipate this slide deck to be used by everybody, but really wanted it to be available as a tool in the toolbox to help further those conversations. And I guess the last thing I'll say here is that these types of, oops, sorry, examples are um, the types of instructional text we've included. So please identify which of the following three slides is most applicable to you. Um, so if Dustin's sitting in Musini, he might choose a rural or remote community. Um, he might choose a northern community or elements from both to include within his presentations as he's uh, advancing that work forward. And then, you know, you might replace some of this green text with an impact that had happened in your own community. So I'll leave it there just to say that, again, this PowerPoint template can be downloaded at that fcm.ca slash climate convos and is available in both English and French. Um, the discussion guide as well is available in English and French, and the PowerPoint template includes both English and French resources. We haven't translated English resources because they're not ours to translate, but we have ind indicated if they're available in both official languages. So I think I'm close to on time here, but I will end my presentation here and uh, leave you in the good hands of Duane and Karina as we move, it, move along. Many thanks, Eva. Um, and for uh, the French members of the audience here, um, as Eva said, all of these resources are also available in French, which can be downloaded from fcm.ca slash parlons climat. Um, I will now turn it over to Duane Nichol, the CAO of the City of Selkirk, Manitoba. Thanks, Dustin. I'm going to uh, attempt to uh, sh share my slides here. And just let me know when. Uh... So are we showing the full deck here or yeah. the presentation mode? The full deck. Perfect. This is the first time ever that someone can say that I'm playing with the full deck. OK, uh, yeah, so we will move along here. Um, so in 2018, the uh, city of Selkirk was accepted into uh, the uh, Climate and Asset Management Network program. It's, uh, it was the pure Pardon me, it was a program that offered peer learning opportunities, training and funding to help Canadian municipalities integrate climate change and sustainability considerations into their uh, decisions around infrastructure. So out of the 19 communities that were accepted, Selkirk was the smallest and we were the only one from Manitoba um, uh, selected. As part of that, we received some grant dollars and we used those dollars in part to partner with uh, the climatologists and the specialists at the, out of the University of Winnipeg and the Prairie Climate Centre, and they helped us develop our climate adaptation plan. So we, we knew that uh, we, we wanted to take action, that's why we participated in the program, we're asked to participate in the program. Uh, however, we knew that we also didn't have any climatologists or climate specialists on staff, and so there's lots of, of data out there, um, but uh, uh, we it wasn't it wasn't in a format that we that we felt we could use to 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 create action. So we we partnered with the the PCC to um, look at that uh, to um, uh, to translate that that data into uh, into expected impacts. We 
really wanted to understand from a season by season basis what we could expect to see in our daily work. Uh, we really wanted a high degree of fidelity because we knew that we wanted to engage our uh, staff. So we had about 20 people from all departments uh, and, and throughout the, the, the hierarchy, right? Just from, from uh, myself right down to frontline employees. We wanted to engage them in the process. And to do that, we knew that we needed to get really granular, get really, really uh, fine detail and, and have them really truly understand at a deep level what we should expect climate change would mean for us because that would empower them to start participating uh, in the in the identification of consequences or, or impacts um, and then also to start participating in the uh, identification of solutions or responses. So we, uh, uh, so accessible and actionable, uh, again, season by season, but also service area by service area. So trying to get it as close as possible to people's daily work so that they could understand what it meant and they can propose some solutions. Uh, we considered the impacts. Uh, we looked at this, uh, and identified consequences of those impacts. We then evaluated uh, the risk of each consequence and ranked them. And then we took the, uh, the very high and high risk uh, consequences and proposed mitigation actions. And we literally come up with hundreds of mitigation actions with, uh, within the team. We then uh, evaluated uh, the mitigation actions uh, using a, a matrix, a decision matrix that included things like effectiveness, feasibility, acceptability, as well as equitability. So looking at that social equity impact as well. And we, we consider the costs, both upfront costs or construction costs or you know, uh, capital costs, as well as operating costs or life cycle costs. We considered the top actions, uh, rolled them together into uh, 12 uh, um, into 12 tactics, which are at the back of our, our uh, strategy document. And then we brought that strategy to council for their formal adoption for their approval. And then once approved, we could roll that into our uh, 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 business planning process. So this is a sort of a graphic representation of our business planning process. All of our strategy doc documents, our program level strategy documents go through this process. Um, each one of those strategies identifies tactics. So each one of those tactics is translated into a tactical worksheet, kind of like a business case document. Uh, it is then reviewed by the full management team and then added to our multi-year tactical plan. Uh, this ensures that the strategy documents are uh, not just pretty documents that are left on a shelf somewhere, but they are put into action. Uh, it also trans uh, it transfers the ownership of the ideas from the person or from the department uh, that's proposing to uh, to the entire organization. So we all are accountable to the outcomes. It also helps ensure that these ideas uh, outlive maybe the people that that propose them. You know, have staff changes, but also outlives the council that approves them. So they're not just plans uh, up until the next election. They they live beyond that. So this is um, uh, this means that the actions are budgetable and. You know, uh, if I can't budget it, I can't do it. So uh, it's really critical that we get it to that to that level. Each of the tactics have a clear start, a clear end, something that you can budget their uh, distinct project in, in and of themselves. So here you see those 12, these 12 tactics. Um, we have, our 10 year uh, strategy is not a, a revolutionary strategy. We're not doing anything necessarily groundbreaking. Uh, in, none of these things are, are, are new and unique. Um, uh, however, uh, uh, we focused on on projects that were long term in, in nature, so they, we knew it would take some time to to implement. Uh, they were lower cost, and they also had multi benefit. Uh, they were multi benefit solutions. Um, Dwayne, uh, just yeah. interrupt for one quick second. I think your uh, microphone might have shifted down a little bit. Um, just got quieter a second ago. Okay, how's that now? Much better. Thank you. Okay, I apologize for that. I, I was hearing popping sound. I didn't know if I was hitting my piece too hard and people were, uh, anyways, we'll move on. So, um, yeah, so we, we focus on those elements. And so I can summarize this with, with uh, you know, these, this plan is mostly about trees, plans, and pipes. Uh, we created new systems or enhancing, plan to create new systems or enhance systems to support decision-making uh, to help us evolve the city to a more adaptive state over time. Um, COVID has thrown us for a bit of a loop, uh, but uh, we're, uh, um, uh, most of our projects are, you know, some of them are delayed, but they're not deferred. So, so we're working on them, but we're not quite all, as far along as we want it to be. So I'm just going to give you a really quick rundown of where we're at to date. Uh, establishing a tree program. So we have a policy that's uh, in the final stages of development. It, we expect it to be finished before the end of this year. And so that is uh, checked. Um, uh, we have a tree inventory that's supposed to take us three years. Uh, we have great staff and they were able to com uh, complete it this year, so a, a year ahead of schedule. 
Uh, we have, uh, we've incorporated uh, uh, climate change adaptation into our risk policy. So making sure that we're giving priority to our wastewater renewal projects that separate our stormwater from our, our, our uh, septic sewers. Uh, implementing the Street Tree program is in the 2021 draft budget, so we're started that, that process today or now, but uh, but uh, it's not approved by council, so we're tentatively positive. You know, tentatively, it's uh, it's completed, or at least on the way to, to being completed, and uh, establishing a an, uh, an aquifer monitoring program, and so that is in a budget as well, or planned for the 2021 budget. Uh, we have uh, the extreme. Uh, heat and cold respite services as objectives in our uh, uh, recreation facilities uh, feasibility studies. We have some studies going on on some our rec facilities, and uh, those have been included in the RFP. We're still conducting the studies, but we we anticipate that those documents will come back with some clear uh, uh, outcomes uh, with the, with this intention in, in mind. Uh, creating a policy and protocol for municipal service delivery during extreme heat. So how do we treat our staff? What services do we provide citizens in these events? We're not, it's not something we're currently doing. Uh, we're significantly delayed on that front just because COVID really had a big impact on, on um, our um, uh, capability. Uh, so we had to do a lot of HR work this year. So delayed, we expect to get that done in 2021, but we haven't started just yet. Actually, I'm going to go back here and so just some of the things that haven't been done uh, establishing an urban forest program so just an ongoing maintenance of all trees not just street trees but the entire urban canopy including on private property uh, preparing and updating a water master plan and so once we have an understanding of this capacity and re recharge rate of our aquifer we can change our water master plan to reflect that uh, you know a policy and protocol for responding to water shortage events. Uh, that's also on the on the tap for for uh, in the mid in mid range uh, planning, conducting a land drainage improvement study, and then also implementing the land drainage improvement study. So, the um, the last component that I'll speak to is just the work that we've done around communications because we really think that this is a really, really important. Part of our approach to, to this has been normalizing the idea of adaptation, uh, mainstreaming it as it were, so that uh, uh, we have the social license to make changes as we need to make changes, as well as make the financial commitment and investments that we need to make as we need to make them. Our uh, Going beyond that even, our, our sustainable economic development team have sort of reframe the whole conversation around the idea that uh, this is actually uh, an attraction to investment into our community. So uh, identifying the fact that if you're going to make an investment, whether you're a business, a, a residential development or, or uh, uh, you know, an, an industry, moving to Selkirk or investing in Selkirk is a good plan because we have the vision. We know that in the long run, our infrastructure is going to continue to provide those, those services as the climate changes. Um, and, and, and in addition to that, as a result of that, uh, our tax structure uh, should be somewhat stable because we're not going to need to respond. Uh, we don't anticipate having to respond reactively to, to these threats to the community. So what you see here is just some snapshots. We have uh, the, the Prairie Climate Center did a micro documentary of our process and we have that on our website and we've used that lots in presentations uh, right across the country actually. Um, we were featured in the CBC National um, Winnipeg media, which for we're about 30 kilometers outside of Winnipeg. It's, so it's a big thing to get uh, Winnipeg media. Uh, you know, we've been featured extensively on our climate change adaptation work, as well as some other uh, green initiatives that we've undertaken. And then, um, and this is just a shameless plug here. Uh, uh, you can see I'm quite proud of this. This is uh, the uh, CNAM or Canadian Network of Asset Managers Terra Award we won in 2019 for for this for our adaptation uh, strategy uh, uh, for for uh, innovation in, in asset management because we've linked those two things. Uh, I'm standing on a. I'm being elevated uh, in front of our rec. Uh, facility which has the had the at the time had the largest installation of solar panels in Manitoba a uh, rooftop solar panels in Manitoba so we see great value in the social and political capital that we've generated through the ongoing communication through social media through the media uh, 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 with our citizens and, and, and beyond that uh, because uh, it bleeds into the uh, mitigation conversation which is uh, even harder to have it's more politicized so adaptation is really uh, just core business. Uh, we've, we've tried to make that core business. And then uh, when we get support from the people and then also council, uh, we believe that this will translate into action on, on mitigation or faster action on mitigation. So in closing, um, 
you know, just a few key takeaways. One, meet them where they're at. So this is that, you know, data isn't actionable, insight is. So make sure that, uh, uh, that you're taking that data and you're and, and you're and translating into the language that your decision makers, that your staff, uh, those folks need to to understand, so that they can participate. Because there's an engagement process, there's a buy-in process to that. Uh, integrate, integrate, integrate. You can't make climate change adaptation or mitigation, for that matter, its own thing. Often to the side, you know, outside of what we normally do. That add on, that bolt on. And I was spoke to that. Um, it, it, you know, it is core and, you know, it's about risk management. It is about long range planning. It's about the safety of your citizens. It is, it's about the health of your community. It is core to what we do on a daily basis. So uh, you need to approach it from that perspective. And that leads me into the next point, which is change the default routine gets done. So I, I said, uh, our job was to make climate change adaptation as boring as possible because boring actually gets done, uh, make it a routine. So change those systems of thinking, those systems of decision-making, your asset management plans, your, your uh, business planning cycles, your financial analysis tools, your business case development tools, change all of those things uh, so that the default setting um, on those decision-making tools is leading your community to a more adapted state. Uh, and then finally get started. So given the long-term nature of, of, uh, of the problem, action today is actually more beneficial or more valuable than than a larger action uh, later or tomorrow, right? Because uh, these small actions compound and, and achieve better benefits. You're also building momentum so that you do the things that aren't really expensive, but move you along the way, give you better data, give you better systems. And then when you're needing to make those bigger investments, you have, have the history of, of uh, and you've got some momentum behind you and you've got the people, the decision makers behind you and you can you can pull the pin on those things. And that is all I have for today. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Um, I'll now turn it into our last presenter today, uh, Karina Richters, the Manager of Sustainability and Climate Change with the City of Windsor in Ontario. Okay. Okay, do you see my presentation? Okay, you can hear me too. Okay, so um, thank you for inviting me to uh, kind of go through our, our 10 year history now with adaptation planning in the city. Um, so obviously Windsor is the southernmost city um, in Canada and we're about 230,000 population. Um, and like I said, we've been kind of um, trying to address adaptation planning for over 10 years now. It really started back in Okay, I can't move my slide, one second. Oh, okay, there you go. Um, it really started back in 2010 uh, when we really started looking at what does an adaptation plan look like for the city? And at the time, again, we were just getting started and we didn't have a lot of examples to go on, um, but we knew that there was issues with extreme heat and precipitation in Windsor. So we really focused on, on that when we really first started this conversation. Uh, and we kind of went through the Ickley Bark process, uh, the five milestones to basically figure out what should we be planning on? And our 2012 plan really focused on, like what Dwayne said, some really early wins that we could do. Um, so there was 22 adaptation actions uh, on extreme heat preparedness and response. Um, like ceiling manhole covers for extreme precipitation, like really small, um, low hanging fruit that can really get that conversation started. By 2017, 2018, the city had completed 18 of those 22 actions. Um, so we considered the plan, uh, the adaptation plan really a win. Uh, and we had some forethought uh, when we did this, uh, this earlier plan was that we knew that we'd have to look at redoing the plan at some point, um, using new science, reviewing our vulnerability and our risks. Um, we really didn't see that, I, I guess, I personally didn't see that within five years, we'd actually be thinking, wow, we've, we've accomplished everything we set out in this plan and we need to move forward because we were starting to see new risks uh, presenting themselves. And we also, again, you know, as our first shot at it, we identified that there was room for improvement um, this plan was really based on corporate um, buy-in and 
what the what our corporate staff were seeing. We didn't involve the community very much at all. We also had no tools to um, measure our success in this plan. So we thought that moving forward, we, we needed to address that. Um, so we did. Um, so a little bit about Windsor's climate. Um, like most of us, we're getting warmer. Uh, we're gonna uh, likely triple our days above 30 uh, by the end of the century. Uh, we're getting wetter. We've, we've seen um, our precipitation trends climbing um, and we're getting wilder. Uh, we've, we've done, uh, we do, we, sorry, we've redone our IDF curves, which is actually showing our current 100 year storm will likely return every 20 years. Um, and as well, we've also undertaken studies to figure out what's gonna happen within the Great Lakes. And you can see some of our figures there um, under the different scenarios, what uh, could be happening in the east end of our city around Lake St. Clair and the, the possible failures of uh, our dike system in that area under those future climate scenarios. So we're getting warmer, we're getting wa wetter and wilder. Um, so just a little bit, if you look at these pictures, all these pictures here have, are basically pictures taken within the last four years. Um, we've experienced tornadoes, um, we've lost all the, um, that second picture there is actually uh, solar panels that went live the day before the tornado hit and ripped the solar panels off the roof of our transit facility. Um, we've had incidents of, well, two major incidents of uh, extreme precipitation where people were actually canoeing and paddle boarding down city streets. Um, we've had extre ex extreme windstorms, high water levels, which have basically um, made a, a lot of marinas in this in the city, including our locally, our municipally owned um, marina be underwater. We've seen uh, the provincial highway number three buckle under the extreme heat. Um, and of course, we're also dealing with vector borne diseases, um, including the, uh, what we what appears to be now the um, basically the winterizing of the uh, 80s aegypti and 80s elbow picto mosquitoes which causes or can carry zika fortunately we have not found that yet uh, but these are all instances uh, again even since the creation of our 2012 plan that windsor is experiencing um, so when you're talking about adaptation planning uh, one of the things i always say is you know never let a good storm pass you by, use that to leverage action um, because it obviously speaks volumes to what the community risk is for your community. Um, and then, you know, for those finance people out there, you can put cost to stuff too. So you can see in Windsor, um, since 2016, our community, our, the city has spent over $3 million just responding to these events. Um, we've also had to reconstruct our marina, uh, which uh, turned out to be about $4.2 million. Um, obviously, these costs are actually higher because we were competing with all the private marinas that also had to reconstruct. Um, and then we also had to repair our shoreline uh, due to increase in erosion because of high lake levels. Uh, so these are all things that, you know, a municipality is responsible for, and we're seeing uh, huge impacts from our changing climate. Um, and then in 2016 and 2017, uh, again, we had flooding that um, resulted in over 9,000 basements flooding in those two years alone. Uh, we saw insured losses within our community of $235 million. And based on a survey we undertook with the Partners for Action, um, we estimate only 40% of our community members actually recovered because of insurance. So you can almost double this cost um, as the actual community impact um, from those two storms alone. And uh, the 2016 and 2017 storms were considered the one in 100 year events, uh, which we've also seen uh, again this year in 2020. Um, so again, it kind of goes and reinforces that data we're seeing where we're expecting this 100 year to be coming, returning every 20 years. So going into our second take at our adaptation planning, we really followed the, um, the same process uh, when we engaged with the corporate team, um, where I basically sat down and met with every single department to see what they were seeing, what they were hearing, 
Uh, but this time we also did in parallel our community task force. And you can see members from our conservation authority, our public health unit, university, college. Um, and we really, you know, we, we wanted to hear what was happening um, and what they felt because we, we figured, or one, again, one of the downsides of our first plan was we didn't have that community buy-in. Um, so we didn't have that community supporting our actions uh, in the plan. Um, so again, we did these, this planning in parallel between the two. And how did we do that? We basically had a lot and a lot of meetings. Um, so this isn't gonna be for everybody, but I think it worked for us um, because it, um, any, every single department can see their piece of information that they were able to provide in the plan. So our first meeting was really to go th through the climate science which, with all the corporate teams, um, as well as the community. Um, and then I let them decide what the impacts were. So the, the corporate and the community, they came back to me and said, here's our impacts. We had meetings for vulnerability and risk. Uh, we had meeting five, which was brainstorming the adaptation actions, and then also meeting with everybody to review the plan. So in total, there were six meetings with every department. Um, as we came along, we started bringing departments together where we saw um, uh, alignments uh, to kind of reduce some of that. But again, it was constant um, collaboration. And what my team really tried not to do was to put our words into the department's or the community's mouth. We want them to see themselves within the plan um, so they would have buy-in. So doing this, we actually created a lot of work for ourselves. Um, so we can see here that um, through the corporate, all the corporate meetings, uh, our corporate staff came up with 150 different climate impacts for the city and our community task force came up with 50. Um, so what we did, we had the challenge of trying to look at all those impacts and figuring out where, where's their overlap, uh, where are they really the same impact, just maybe phrased differently. And we were able to take like those 200 plus impacts down to 30. Um, and then we went back, so meeting three, when we went back to the corporate and we went back to the community, we took those 30 with us um, instead of 200. So we made it more, um, uh, more manageable. So each of the departments then in the community went through and they rated the vulnerability on those 30. Um, if the department found or the community found that they were vulnerable in that, then we'd move them to the risk assessment stage. Um, I guess that's my 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll speed it up. The, so the, uh, we went to the uh, risk assessment um, and this was also interesting because what you could find out quickly is that not all the departments have all the answers when you're looking at risk. Uh, so for example, when we looked at our impact statement for um, basement flooding, if you talk to our operations group um, and, they, and you ask them about displacement of people, uh, they're like, now, nobody was displaced, but when you actually take that uh, to, the, um, to our community development, they're like, oh, we had X amount of uh, social housing buildings that we had to displace. Um, so it's really looking at making sure you're getting the right people, commenting on the right aspects of the risk assessment, because that really changed our, our risk for a lot of items. Um, from that, we end up having 19 that we proceeded with um, and actually the adaptation planning, oops. And then those 19, really, they come down to these objectives, seven objectives that we want to strive for. We wanna protect public health and safety. We wanna reduce risk to buildings and properties. We wanna strengthen our infrastructure resiliency, protect biodiversity, enhance ecosystem functions, reduce community service disruptions and build community resilience. Um, and how are we going to do that? We're really going to do that by integrating climate change thinking and response through um, not just through our adaptation planning process, but through other methods like including a climate lens on our council reports, asset management planning, um, and other major uh, planning documents. And then I'm going to end off with just a couple um, slides here on the cost of doing nothing. One of our city councillors asked when we were doing the adaptation plan was to basically try and give them a, a price if we don't do this. Um, so what I did for each 
impact. Um, I try to use either results of our master planning documents or a response to put a value um, to basically show the community and that, again, you know, adapting to climate change is more than just being a feel good environmental reason, that there is an economic justification behind it. So here's just one example of, you know, if we don't act and upgrade, update our sewer system, what figures we can be looking at. You know, we could look at a, is that a $3 billion um, cost every 20 years? Uh, just to respond to extreme precipitation events. Um, and then you can get even into the littler things of the cost of doing nothing for drainage for sports facilities. You know, 2019 alone, we had to refund $232,000 to rec leagues because they couldn't actually use our fields because they were uh, saturated from heavy rains in the spring. Um, so it just gives you another tool to actually justify why we need to move this forward, why we need to bring it to asset management plans, um, and why we need to be considering this upfront, because to go back after and redesign something is gonna be a lot more expensive than thinking of it upfront. And I went over, but that is it, thank you. And thank you very much, Karina. Um, I guess we're just about at time and don't want to keep anyone um, past what they signed up for. Um, so I'll start with just a thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, if you have any follow-up questions for myself, um, CCCS, um, Dwayne, Karina, or Eva, uh, you should have each received an email from me just about an hour ago. Um, if you reply to that, I can or I would happily forward it on to anyone. Um, and I guess just to grab one closing thought from Dwayne and Karina, this is a webinar about starting conversations after all and for, um, for actions to happen within municipalities. And a lot of time it requires the sign off from council, it requires that direction. So if you're gonna um, provide some advice to the audience here for approaching council with a really targeted um, point for how to get adaptation rolling in your community. One sentence, your elevator pitch, what might it be? Well, I'll throw it back at you, Dustin. I don't think you should. I think what you should do is look at uh, uh, all the things you can do as an, administra as an administrator or through your, your daily work, right? I, I believe that the first approach is to, is, to, is to incorporate some of the risk considerations. You have to do that anyways. Uh, you're putting millions of dollars in and above and on top of the ground. Uh, you've you've got to make sure that's going to survive the, into the future. Okay. Um, and I think I kind of already mentioned it and in Windsor's case, you know, um, it was a pretty easy sell for us because we were already seeing the impacts and we're seeing them occurring very fast in our community. Um, so I think we've, I don't want to say lucked out because <laughs> in one way it's not really lucking out, but it's made that conversation easy um, for us. Uh, but I think any municipality probably has their one thing that you know, that means a lot to their community. And if they can figure out how to protect that, um, you know, that's maybe somewhere to, some, a little tidbit on how to get in there. Okay. Well, Karina, Dwayne, Eva, Zana, thank you very much for joining me here today. Um, uh, Karina, you just received a comment if you want to read that, but um, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in today and have yourselves a great one. Um, both the English and French versions of uh, this webinar have been recorded and um, if you'd like to share it, I'll send around a downloadable recording within the next few days and I'll hope to have a um, uh, internet version up soon. Have a great one. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Yeah, take thank care. You. Everyone. Thank you.